I wanted to share a story of a boy, a 14-year-old boy, Joshua Osborne, who was lying in coma at a hospital in Wisconsin about two years ago. Joshua's brain was swelling with fluid. The doctors did a number of tests, but couldn't identify the root cause. It was getting very frustrating for Joshua's parents and the doctors. What could they do to save Joshua? The doctors then recommended one final test, one more test, using an experimental technology. In the, fi the first procedure of its kind, the test would look at Joshua's cerebrospinal fluid for pieces of DNA. It turned out the test was successful. Researchers were able to look at Joshua's fluid, cerebrospinal fluid and pinpoint the cause of his illness within a few hours. It turns out he was infected with an obscure species of bacteria. Doctors were able to eradicate it and save Joshua's life in a matter of a few days. This ability to save Joshua's life comes from being able to analyze DNA sequences at very quick time and at much lower cost today. In fact, the cost of DNA sequencing has dropped from about $10 million in 2007 to less than $1,000 today, at a rate much faster than Moore's law. And simultaneously, the number of human genomes sequenced during this period has grown exponentially. From getting the first genome sequenced in 2007 to having the publicly available 1,000 genome data set in 2013 to the current sequencing capacity in the world, the number of human genomes sequenced is doubling every seven months. And this is placing a lot of stress in the compute and storage infrastructure in these centers. A lot of these sequencing centers and genomic labs are moving to the cloud today to address their compute and storage needs. It all started when a seminal paper was published in 1866, a paper based on years of studying visible traits in pea plants by a person named Gregor Mendel, an Augustinian friar in the Czech Republic today. Mendel showed how invisible factors were shaping the visible traits of the pea plants. The age of genetics was born, and Mendel's work really laid the foundation of today's genetics. But with cloud, big data, and AI, the pace of innovation in genomics is accelerating. In 1990, the genomics community started on an ambitious goal, a quest to sequence all the three billion base pairs in the human genome. After 13 years, they completed it, two years ahead of schedule, and at a cost of a little less than $3 billion. Now you might ask, why is this important? Well, the Human Genome Project today has already led to the discovery of more than 1,800 disease genes. And there are over 2,000 genetic tests today that patients can take to learn the risks of their inherited diseases and for doctors to cure these diseases, to diagnose these diseases. The, the Human Genome Project has really enabled a new generation of precision medicine today, one that is personalized, that's preventive, and one that's preemptive. And with leveraging the cloud and AI, has helped this sequencing analysis and diagnosis to run much faster, better, and at a lower cost. But you might be wondering, why is this a big data problem? Let's take a look at some of the big generators of data today and extrapolate them by eight years to the year 2025. Twitter today generates about half a billion tweets, and in eight years is expected to need probably about one to two petabytes of incremental storage a year. The largest astronomy data sets coming out of the square kilometer array that's going to go live in 2020 will probably need about one exabytes of incremental storage every year. YouTube will probably need about one to two exabytes of incremental storage a year. Today, there are about 2,500 high throughput genomic sequences in more than 1,000 centers worldwide. Assuming a reasonable projection rate, 
they're going to require anywhere between 2 to 40 exabytes of incremental storage every year. And that is just for storing the human genome alone. This will be the big data of the future. So what are the challenges for handling this genomics uh, data at scale? How do you acquire and store this data efficiently and cheaply? How do you process it? And how do you derive intelligence from it? Let's take a look at how genomics data is first acquired and processed. It's a simple five-step process. First, you extract and purify a sample, either your saliva or a sample of blood. Then you use a sequencing machine, a machine that extracts the DNA from the nucleus inside the cells in the sample. And then you align each of these sequences. This machine extracts about millions of different fragments of sequences, each about 100 to 150 characters long. You then align each of these sequences to a reference genome. In this case, a large string that's about 3 billion base pairs long. Fundamentally, it's a very large approximate string matching problem. Once you have aligned each of these sequences, you then look for all possible genes that can match in that location in a process called variant calling. And once you have identified the gene that matches, you look for the difference in the match between the sample and the reference. And these differences, the mutations, are then looked up against a knowledge base to identify the impacts and the implications of these mutations. So, straightforward process, but it turns out that speed in this entire process is going to be very critical if it's going to be used by doctors for diagnosis, especially in life-threatening situations. So how do you go from sample to sequence to alignment to variant calling to identifying the mutations, understanding the effects, all in a matter of a few hours? You really need fast algorithms and a very scalable compute infrastructure. One breakthrough in genomic alignment algorithms came a few years ago from a lecture that Bill Bolovsky and Ravi Pandya from Microsoft Research attended. In this lecture, the basic idea was to use a large hash table, basically hash to all the locations in the human reference genome where a sequence of characters in each of the sequences can occur. They invented a technology called SNAP, and SNAP is now blazingly fast in alignment and in variant calling. To give you a sense of how fast it is, it is about more than seven times faster than some of the most commonly used alignment algorithms today, and without sacrificing accuracy. So this speed in genomic analysis is enabling a whole slew of new applications. For instance, you can now monitor new pathogens and identify outbreaks before they can happen, outbreaks like SARS or the swine flu. Given the speed of SNAP, you can use it in controlling the quality of the sequencing process. As the sequencing process goes through, you run SNAP, figure out whether the quality of the sequences are good. If not, go back and redo the sequencing process. Very often, there are new reference versions of the human genome that are released. You can also use SNAP to then go back and remap historically aligned sequences to the new reference genome. All this is enabling a virtual cycle of genomics and AI today. The genomics data that's being collected at a high throughput is being analyzed by faster and more intelligent algorithms on the cloud that's enabling a slew of new applications, which in turn is generating demand for more new data to be generated, more new genomic data to be generated. Cutting-edge research in genomics is also now going beyond uh, diagnosis and looking at treatment options as well, using a technique called gene editing. The idea of gene editing is very simple. You give the biomedical researchers a way to make very precise and targeted changes to the genome. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, there are two reasons. The researchers can totally knock out or disable a gene and understand its function, for example, in a mice. Or if they know the function of the gene, and if it's a faulty gene, say in a human, 
they can insert new DNA to restore the original function of the gene. This sounds fantastic. And the magical tool that's enabling this is called CRISPR. Let's look at how this whole uh, gene editing works. The Cas9 enzyme, there is an enzyme called the Cas9 enzyme that is shown in uh, orange there that is really like a molecular scissors. It binds to a strand of DNA, of RNA called the guide RNA. The guide RNA takes the Cas9 enzyme and targets a specific location of the genome. The Cas9 enzyme just snips the DNA and cuts it. It's like a molecular scissors that just cuts the strands of the DNA. After the cut, you can either insert new gene, you can either insert new DNA to restore the gene, or you can disable the gene completely. It turns out that the very critical step to enable gene editing is to figure out where to cut the genome. It turns out there are 18 billion combinations of guide RNA, 300 guide RNAs, about 20,000 human genes, and about 3,000 target locations on the genome. And there are two characteristics that you want to keep in mind for gene editing. First of all, given all these guide RNAs, you want to pick that RNA which is able to target a specific gene that you want to go and, uh, and modify the function of. Second one, you want to reduce the on-target activity, the probability that the guide RNA is going to take the Cas9 enzyme and damage a different part of the gene than you originally intended. That can lead to a lot of side effects. And it's nearly impossible to uh, quantify, measure all of these efficiencies in a wet lab. The more realistic alternative is to approach this as a big data and a compute problem. Researchers from Microsoft and from the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard have invented a new technique called CRISPR-ML, a machine learning-based technique for identifying which guide RNA to use to target each of the 20,000 genes in the human genome. It's basically like a, similar to a website ranking for relevance. CRISPR-ML uh, looks at all of the guide RNAs, the properties of the guide RNAs, the properties of the genes, the thermodynamics of the DNA, and a bunch of other characteristics, and builds a machine learning model to rank each of the guide RNA in their target efficiencies. And using the power of the Azure cloud to scale, they were able to compute and store all of these on-target efficiencies and the off-target activities in a matter of a few days. Now, if you want to see, for example, which guide RNA to use to target a gene, you enter the name of the gene in this CRISPR-ML tool, and you get back the scores, both the on-target and the off-target scores from this gene, or from this tool. This is really amazing progress in gene editing in just a matter of a few years, very short few years. Using CRISPR-ML, Researchers are finding about a 20% improvement in their targeting efficiencies and about a 50% reduction in the time and cost per gene. So today, we are at a tipping point where genomics, the cloud, data, and AI are empowering researchers to save and change human lives. We in the data and AI community can partner with these researchers in a quest to understand what makes us, us. Thank you.